I'm going to start and then tell you how much I'm so happy to see so many of you again um, for so many conferences. And this is a special conference for me. So I wrote something. So it wouldn't be just off the cuff. It's special for me because 17 is enough. So good morning and welcome to the 17th Annual Coleman Conference on Cognitive Disability and Technologies. We have an outstanding program planned for you today filled with inspiring keynotes, insights from policy leaders in Washington and the tech industry, innovative research and practice, and opportunities to network with leaders who value the inclusion of people with cognitive disabilities to our rapidly advancing digital world. As you know, a conference of this size and reputation does not happen by accident. It is the result of a great deal of hard work and, and uh, commitment by passionate professionals and advocates throughout the country. I thank the staff of the Coleman Institute for Cognitive Disabilities uh, most of all for making this happen, despite the fact that many of them are not currently in the room right now, possibly, didn't sleep well last night, and are now working registration and addressing logistics. I thank Shay Tanis right there, Genevieve Berry, and I'm sure she's back in the back. <laughs> and Richard Hemp, and Jennifer Kraft, and Joy Wu, and Amy Lewinsky, our new hire. And we're so pleased to have her with us. She comes to us from Washington, DC. And uh, <clears throat> you'll learn a lot more about her, as you should. Uh, <clears throat> Please give them all a round of applause. I may be the one opening <clears throat> this 17th conference today, but it is also a closing for me. It has been my privilege to chair this annual conference for the past 17 years and to lead the Coleman Institute. Each year, I have been a small part of a remarkable experience that brings together exceptional people throughout the United States and abroad. It has been stimulating, to say the least. This year, our conference theme is forecasting the future. We truly are in a midst of challenging times. Times have always been challenging for cognitive disability uh, and its community. Since the first fights for civil rights and the first female president of the Ark of the United States in 1950, that would be uh, Elizabeth Boggs, to the fight for technology and information accessed uh, today, stimulated by Bill and Claudia Coleman. The Institute has provided a national forum to catalyze uh, developments in technology, research, practice, and public policy. For 17 years, we have uh, promoted opportunities that technology offers people with cognitive disabilities and their families, and employers. We worked nationwide and beyond to inform academics, 
public and private organizations, and the general public on the role that technology can play in creating more equitable opportunities for everybody, not just for the elites in our society. We know that technology is a potent tool for inclusion in our society. In support of this vision, the Institute has funded scores of research and dissemination projects and influenced public policy on a nationwide basis. Recently, with all of you, we conceived and implemented a fundamental concept, the rights of people with cognitive disabilities to technology and information access. This initiative has real gravitas and will have more in the future. But it would not have seen the light of day if not for Bill and Claudia, Claudia Coleman's Institute and for your presence, every one of you, in this remarkable annual conference on technology. The Coleman Institute is also particularly pleased with these accomplishments and of the scores of grants we have made to faculty and partners across the four campuses of the University of Colorado and across the nation for that matter. We are particularly pleased to have facilitated the nation's initial national competition for the first National Center on Cognitive Disability and Technology in the United States. Dr. Kathy Bodine and her staff won that competition in 2004, and she and her staff still run it. Where are you? Where are you? Give her a hand. There she is. With leaders behind us, like Bill and Claudia, and Dr. Shea Tanis, the Coleman Institute will continue to support technology solutions in the future. I encourage each of you in this audience, every one of you, to continue to embrace a worldwide future where technology facilitates social inclusion and where everyone with cognitive disabilities, and I mean everyone, has the opportunity to experience a quality of life rich with personal relationships, civic participation, employment, and economic success. It has been my privilege for 17 years here to work with many of you in this audience. Most of all, I thank Bill and Claudia Coleman for their faith in my ability to lead the Institute over these years. I have valued your guidance and I have appreciated your constant kindness more than you know. We made a fine team and we had a long run in the sun. I also thank the special support and friendships I received from two key, key colleagues in the Coleman Institute, Enid Ablowitz and Professor Michael Leitner. They both contributed significantly, significantly to the Institute for many years. As for me, I'm stepping down as Executive Director of the Coleman Institute and Senior Associate Vice President of the University of Colorado System. I'll be moving exclusively to my academic appointment in the CU Department of Psychiatry. So I'm not going away completely, I'm sorry. <laughs> and I'll be continuing to run the federally funded State of the States and Developmental Disabilities, you'll be glad to know. The best thing an, ex an, 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 an administrator can do when he's, when he's leaving or she's leaving is to leave quietly and to leave the organization better off than he or she found it. It's not my place to judge whether I reach that goal for the Institute. 
But it is a goal leaders should constantly seek. Sometimes I think I did reach that goal. Sometimes I wish I could have done more. I leave this evaluation to President Bruce Benson and to Bill and Claudia, and to all of you who have worked with us for these 17 years. I am sure of one thing, though. The next 17 years of the Coleman Institute will exceed the achievements of the past 17 years. And today's conference is the first step in that brighter future. 17 is enough. Thank you. Well, I cannot um, start this conference without saying a couple words about Dr. David Braddock. He doesn't know I'm doing this. So, um, Dr. David Braddock's career in the field of intellectual and developmental disabilities has spanned 50 years, and he is considered one of the giants in the field. He has 318 research items and research gates. <laughs> that has been read over 8,000 times and cited nearly 2,500 times. He founded the first program at the University of Illinois Chicago in, uh, in disability studies. And he continues today the work he initiated in his doctoral dissertation on determinants of public spending in the states, in the states and intellectual and developmental disabilities project of national significance, funded continuously by the Administration on Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities. This project places critical information in the hands of advocates and legislators to make systemic and programmatic change in the services and for supports for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. There are very few of us who can say that our doctoral dissertation has traveled 35 years. <laughs> Dr. Braddock's accomplishments stem from his many valued qualities, but two significant to note are his passion for this community and his rivaled strategic mind. It was that strategic mind and passion for human dignity and opportunity that brought the Coleman Institute to co of, on Cognitive Disabilities to its national and international reputation. It was that strategic mind that brought us the Declaration on the Rights of People with Cognitive Disabilities to Technology and Information Access. And it was that strategic mind that realized the Declaration Implementation Grants to showcase the tangible impact that technology can have in the lives of people with cognitive disabilities and their families. Peter Stropel once said, legacy is not something you leave with people, but leave in people. Dr. Braddock has shown us the path leaving within us the passion and the knowledge to make meaningful change in the world and lives of people with cognitive disabilities. So for that legacy, we thank you. OK, now that we got the crying out, um, we have an incredible day planned for you. <laughs> we are so fortunate to be supported in our mission and our valued partners and sponsors, the Association of University Centers on Disability, the American Network of Community Options and Resources, the ARC of the US Alliance, NAD, JFK Partners, and the American Association on Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities. At the AIDD Bookstore, located in the atrium, you can purchase publications on contemporary research by the leading authority in intellectual and developmental disabilities. And by joining, receive a sparkly lanyard. So, it is now my honor to introduce our morning keynote speaker, Professor Misha Doler, from across the pond in King's College, London.
Professor Dollar is head of the Center for Telecommunications Research, professor, chair professor of the Wireless Communications, fellow and distinguished lecturer with the IEEE, holds a dozen patents, patents and authored several books. He is also a composer and pianist with five ad albums and his most recent, Stories from Another World, album you may have heard as you entered the ballroom today. Professor Dollar has been at the forefront of new and promising technologies such as smart cities, big data, the internet of things, cybersecurity, machine learning, 5G, and the tactile internet. These transformative technologies promise to significantly change the way we live, work, and play. The tactile internet, for example, can change the way that people interact in the digital world by adding a new sensory modality to share information for people with cognitive disabilities, removing the literacy barrier that so much plagues our opportunity to engage. As new technology solutions emerge, Part of our challenge as a community is to keep with the pace of innovation. Without knowledge, we, can't make meaningful, we cannot meaningfully participate in the development of these emerging technologies, and we risk being left further and further behind. So project, to project us into the future of the Internet of Skills, I am thrilled to bring to the stage Professor Misha Dollar. Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. The first thing I would like you to do is to all close your eyes. Can we do that, please? Everybody closing your eyes. I want you to imagine the internet. Imagine the internet. What do you see? I'll give you a few seconds. You can open your eyes again. I will not query the room, but I bet the last thing you have seen today, right now, is ethernet, cables routers, the actual infrastructure powering the internet. You probably have seen Facebook, LinkedIn, all these great opportunities where you can actually utilize these services of the internet. So the internet itself has undergone a fascinating transformation from something which was very infrastructure-based 20 years ago. Some of us will still remember the days when uh, the internet was all about uh, nailing ethernet cables to the walls in our dorms and connecting them to the routers using a browser called, uh, what was the name, Netscape, right? Do you, who remembers Netscape here? Oh dear, all right, so here's the barrier of ages. So, uh, but that was, the experience was secondary. It was really that physical experience. And now you zoom forward, you go out in the streets in Colorado, ask the kids, what's the internet? Last thing they will tell you is all this infrastructure thing. That's really fascinating. So we have connected every single computer on the planet today which is a great achievement, and we didn't stop with that. We went on and connected every single mobile phone on the planet. We built the mobile internet. And uh, you may have 4G here, and if you do have 4G here, the experience actually is very similar to what you have when you use your computer with an ethernet cable. You actually forget about the connectivity. You just use it very natively. Whatever you do, whether it is at work, whether you're doing your shopping or doing your Skype call, right? Now, you only start to remember there's a problem with your mobile when your 4G goes down to 3G or to 2G, and then you go, oh dear, my operator hasn't rolled out the infrastructure here, right? But we have managed with 4G to get you to this mind frame that you start to forget about it. With 5G, we're gonna up the game still by an order of magnitude, and we're working on that with my center as we speak. Now, we have connected all you with your mobile phones and your laptops, and now what's next? Well, currently as we speak, we're connecting every single thing on this planet. We are building the things internet, or the internet of things as it's known. And uh, you know, we could imagine a world where every single chair is actually connected to the internet. So I would actually know whether you are listening to me, or whether you're falling asleep, um, or whether you're getting impatient and you want to go see the next slide, if there's any next slide here, right? So, so you go. So we can do these type of things. We have uh, these Internet of Things now being rolled out around the world. And, and I think it's a very timely question to ask, what's the next Internet? And the inspiration to this came about three years ago. Uh, 
almost four years ago now, at the height of the Ebola crisis, and King's College London, my university, was leading the United Kingdom's response in Sierra Leone. And one thing my colleagues, my doctor colleagues were reporting uh, was we're lacking skills. We need more medical help. And we're not talking about a medical help which requires very sophisticated things like a brain surgery. It was about palpation, taking temperature, just a human being down there, and that was clearly missing in Sierra Leone at that time. And I thought, hey, why don't we combine our best edge robotic skills with our best uh, telecom skills and with our best AI skills, and we built something which would allow us to virtualize that medical skill set. So we could bring in any doctor in the world to Sierra Leone, and we could schedule them and use them at need. And uh, I gave that uh, artifact a name, and I called it the Internet of Skills, because I thought this is all about skill set uh, distribution. And what was a pipe dream three years ago is actually becoming a reality. The industry is picking up on this. And uh, also now the NSF is picking up on that, the Science Foundation body here. Yes, thank you. Sorry, I always forget. I can chat on. As university professors, you go on talking infinitely. And at some point, I probably need to change slides as well. Right, so that's work. Good. All right. So, um, so that's a story. We started working on that. And I thought, you know, once this is up and running, it would not only disrupt the world of medicine, it would also disrupt the world how we teach, for instance, how I can teach somebody how to play the piano or somebody teaches me how to paint, or how do we repair engines. And uh, we can do a lot of things in our society. And if you think about it, we use digital today to negotiate for jobs, but to execute it, we still travel. And that internet of skills, hopefully in 20 years' time, 15 years' time, 10 years' time, maybe five years' time, will break that barrier. So you will say, hey, you know, but we're on to this, really. So we're building this. You know, why do you build, Misha, this internet of skills if in reality everybody's about artificial intelligence, automation, etc.? And I've shown you this picture. You see it on, on the screen. There's something wrong here on the left-hand side, right? There's one thing missing here. It's people. It's us, humans. We're essentially designing our own grave by coming up with new AI, new automation, where machines are building machines, uh, helping machines to empower machines. And I wanted to do exactly the opposite. I wanted to put us back into the driver's seat and build something where we can execute our skills, our human skills, whatever we are good at. And the inspiration to that came after I had a really fascinating discussion with Hugh, a good friend of mine. He's uh, probably the most senior pilot in British Airways. And I asked him, Hugh, why, why don't we use more the automated flying thing, right? So an airplane today is on autopilot most of the time anyway, taxing the plane, takeoff, flying, landing. Um, you know, algorithmic artificial intelligence should be able to do that. And he told me something really wise, which totally changed my view on my technology world. He said, Misha, if I didn't get into this cockpit every morning, nobody would fly, right? Because humans love humans, and humans trust humans. That's the fundamental story of us, it seems. And uh, what I really want to do is I don't want to get rid of the automation. Some of the job we do should be automated. I want to automate jobs, but I want to humanize work. That's really what we want to do. And uh, you will find yourself, hopefully, in a world where not everything is automated. And uh, you will find yourself also in a world where probably you will only partially trust machines. And let me, let me just query this room very quickly find out how much you would trust, actually, machines. Let me use the case of Tesla. Okay, self-driving car. How many of you would actually today sit in a Tesla, turn around, okay, start working or watching a video or film, and then have the car drive at 80 miles per hour through Denver? Hands up. Who would do it? Oh, dear. That didn't go. All right. The car's outside. I have a good memory. I'll, I'll get you there, right? <laughs> Going to do that later. But you get the idea. Last time I queried a big crowd was in uh, Los Angeles. Uh, 4,000 people, Silicon Valley, all techies. I had 10 hands going up. <laughs> 10 hands. And that's a crowd which is advocating for that technology. You see the problem? Oh, you see the problem. I don't have to tell you that. Uh, so here you go. The human has to be in the loop. Those skilled in the arts will say, hey, Misha, you know, we're, we're doing this already. We have now 
way which allow me to execute skills remotely in one way or another. And in fact, you see one uh, right here on the screen. Some of you will recognize it. It's the Da Vinci uh, robotic surgery device. So you have the patient on here, the doctor seeing in the viewing port and doing the operation remotely. And uh, it's true. But the problem is that thing, sorry, that thing costs two million pounds, three million dollars, two and a half million dollars, right? About three million dollars before Brexit, now it's about two million dollars as well, right? <laughs> there you go. I had to take this, I hope you're filming this. Uh, right. And um, what we want to do is, is something what the internet has achieved. And I want to show you the internet path up here. I want you to understand it because it's really fundamental. About 50 years ago, you could make a video call, no problem. Siemens offered you the capability. It was a Siemens video phone, but you could also only make the, uh, the video call if your pair also had a Siemens video phone. If uh, you both had a Siemens video phone and you had a line which wasn't even switched, there were people putting the, the cables together, you could have a decent video call, right? Problem was, technology only worked Siemens to Siemens, only was very, very expensive. Now, we zoom forward 50 years and we have done some remarkable achievements. We have invented two things which were instrumental. One thing is we invented what we call IP. That's the language of machines, right? We speak English, uh, machines speak IP. As long as you speak IP, you can connect different machines to that very same network, whether it's my mobile phone, my computer, or anything else. Now, we have done that, and we have also invented codecs. Now, codecs are very important because I can film today on my iPhone, and I can play it back on my Dell computer. Something we take for granted, but really 50 years ago wasn't the case because it was Siemens Siemens. Now, we have therefore brought down the barriers of uh, the vendor lock-in. We are able to scale the network. Work, and what we see today is an internet which is essentially powering pretty much everything of this part of, uh, of the 21st century, right? So now we would like to go on and uh, do the very same thing with the haptic edge technology. That's very expensive. We don't have the networks to support that. We don't have these standardized haptic codecs to support that. So I'm wearing a haptic glove here uh, with a, from a company a friend of mine co-founded called NeuroDigital. It is not able to talk to General Electric, to ABB, to Siemens. So I'm introducing standards today which allows me to literally have all these devices uh, talk to each other. So if a, a, a General Electric sensor says something, I can feel it on my hand, right? So that's what we're doing at the moment, building this next generation internet, and it turns out it isn't as easy as we thought, and that's a few technical slides I need to drag you through, um, but that's really very simple. So this is how it looks like. We have, imagine a surgeon or several surgeons here being connected to the internet. It goes to the telecom network, which could be Verizon's network, and then executes on the edge, for instance, a haptic uh, kind of a robotic device on exoskeleton, right? So the big challenge here is to build a bi-directional uh, haptic control with a perception of very low latency. Why is that? Because we humans are wired to experience very low latency. If I hit with my fist, my elbow here, I'm experiencing that very quickly. It's action and reaction within 10 milliseconds. I need to feel that. If I don't, something goes wrong. So therefore, to build a network, an internet, which works from Colorado to London to Australia within 10 milliseconds, that's the biggest challenge we are facing today. And uh, those skilled in the arts will have figured out speed of light is a problem. So delay is a big challenge. And uh, if you look at the human vortex, 10 millisecond is one of these blocks here. And if you just want to have London, Paris communicate with each other, delay is just really gigantic. If you want uh, London, Los Angeles, uh, my work with Los Angeles quite a lot, so I put this one up, speed of light kicks in. So we have different technologies today to get rid of the delay. Uh, the yellow boxes, how do we do that? We are reserving data high lengths today. We're able to do that. The internet today is very flat, so every packet is dealt the same way. We are able today to streamline and fast uh, line packets, so you don't experience that. But the biggest thing we gain really is once we get rid of compression. Compression means that you're not compressing your video signal anymore. 
right? Or you're not compressing your audio signal anymore because it takes a long time to do that. So um, as you got rid of compression, what you end up with is a big latency challenge and bandwidth challenge here. So normally when we do compress video information, we take a lot of time, but compressing it means the data rate goes down substantially. Now the delay goes down, we stop compressing, therefore my bandwidth goes up. So suddenly a, a virtual reality, fully immersive video stream, which before cost me a gigabit per second, cost me 10 mega, gigabit per second. Now imagine we scale this up on every single medical application, all the other applications, and we end up with something what the internet cannot support today. So we need more capacity. And capacity has been built over those decades uh, using wired and wireless infrastructure, and it turns out the best way of getting is to build more antennas, build more infrastructure, right? So that's one of our biggest challenges today. So I'll leave that from a tech point of view, just as a summary, if we want to support support fully immersive internet of skills applications. We need to sort out ultra low latency kind of technology, very wide bandwidth, and many more base stations, which will create a lot of headache for everybody who deploys it, right? So let's move on. Where are we today? Well, we are building 5G right now at King's, and one of the uh, companies I brought up here is Room One, um, who built, who's probably the most advanced in virtual reality, a fully immersed real-time reality. It's a new term we coined, which uh, allows us essentially to be fully immersed in an environment. You put on the, uh, the headset as a 360 camera, and they're able to stitch the signal in a millisecond delay. Nobody else has, has done it not even Google or, or, or Facebook. So we're able now to have a fully real-time type of experience getting essentially the patient to the doctor or, or you to your child or whatever uh, you would like to use. So we're having up and running. Uh, the UK government has just given us a very big grant ready to roll out that type of t t system in the United Kingdom. So if Bristol, Surrey, and Kings, I'm right here in London, and we are connecting the different use cases, building this ultra low latency uh, 5G network. So we're building the Internet of Skills as we speak in the United Kingdom. I'd love to connect it uh, to you guys here, see if we can do something remotely. I've talked to some of you already. Okay, enough technology. Let's move on to the really interesting thing while I'm actually on stage. So the big question is why do we do all that? Right? So why do we come up with all that technology? And um, you know, I'm, I'm found of a few companies, and I realized we build a lot of technology, but it's quite useless if nobody in the end of the day uses it uh, or knows how to use it. So I made it my mission in Kings to actually not only do a bottom-up technology design, but also top-down evangelization of that technology. I went to the different verticals, to the consumers. I asked them, why do you need this? Why would you need uh, virtual reality? Why would you need 5G? Uh, what is it all for? Internet of skills, is that of any use to you? And we had some really fascinating workshops, true co-design over the years, uh, nothing transactional, spending a lot of time together. And the verticals we try to transform are those which are, are all very close to my heart, or King's College is very good at, or there's a big problem uh, in London. And you see transport up here, so if you have been to London, uh, you know it's a big headache. Who of you has been to London, actually? All right, good, uh, and me as well, so <laughs> occasionally when I'm not around the world. So here you go. Uh, so transport is a big nightmare, and uh, we're currently engaging with uh, transport, for, uh, uh, transport for London to disrupt that. So what you see on here is a few verticals, like the health one, which you're very close to, but also the arts one, which I'm very close to, uh, the gaming industry, financial industries, uh, the, the transport industries, etc. And uh, that's what we have done. We started, actually, with looking at how can we build skill sets bottom up. So King's engaged with a really fascinating company uh, called Arcona aspirations are run by Elena. And um, she has been trying to build a skill set out of schools. And I realized that all our education system is actually geared towards you know, building skills from university level on, really. But she realized you know, students, our pupils at schools, are very empowered. They are, they are learning how to program. They know how AI works. Uh, so she got people out of schools and started these hackathons here. And uh, she had a recent one, uh, Archon AI in Mental Health. And she asked, the, the tagline was, what if young people were empowered to create tech to hack happiness, right? So she took teens uh, which had mental health problems uh, and all knew how to deal with it and all knew somebody who had. 
and uh, brought them together, and they were supposed to come up with some tech solutions which would help uh, alleviate the problems. And they had some really good solutions on that, and she's actually going to be in Denmark. I told them here, she said she's going to be here 18th to 19th of November uh, doing right that here with you in Colorado. Right? Uh, what else do we do? Well, we work quite a lot with hospitals. One of the big problems our cardiovascular institute has, uh, led by Professor Ajay, is a, uh, it's a very simple problem, really. So it turns out that uh, King's College London, which you see right here, so London is here, that's all London if you've been here, and that is the southeast of London. And uh, King's College is responsible for the southeast of London. So the catchment areas of patients is all the southeast of London. So we look at Kent here. And in Kent, there's a patient who's been going to the doctor many times, and the doctor hasn't seen there's actually a cardiovascular problem with the patient. It's been sending uh, him or her uh, always in and out. Things got worse until it comes to the point that the patient has to come to London and, uh, and, 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 and needs to be operated or whatever needs to be done. And all that could be avoided if actually some really high-end skill set had had actually a, an insight into what's going on in Kent from day one. So we are building now this ultra-low latency, fully immersed decision-taking capabilities between London and uh, Kent. And this is not about a Skype call. Right, so I, I'm trying to understand, you know, why did doctors not use that before? Well, the, the kind of intimacy you get when you're in a real world, in a real time environment, you really feel your patient one to one, you can have a normal conversation, you can touch somebody, you can feel things, etc. That's the type of capability the internet cannot give you today. So we're building it, right? So we are now looking if that type of digital transformation from hospital to hospital could change their world. What else do we do? We looked at the hospital, uh, the, the the ambulances. So one of the big problems we observe is that uh, with the, in the stroke area, which uh, it turns out to be one of the biggest problems for, um, for death cases, I think it's ranked number three, five million people worldwide die of stroke, and another five million actually remain disabled for, very, for, for a lifetime. So it's a huge economic cost and, uh, of course, very big social impact. So we said, hey, you know, why don't we look at this use case, and we figured out that for stroke, you need to react very quickly. Uh, the, the first 10, 20, 30 minutes are very important. And those of you who are skilled in the arts in the room will probably know better than I do. And um, it turns out that that's the time the patient typically spends in the ambulance. Now, the ambulance cannot have high-end tools really embedded in the ambulance, so therefore we said, why can't we virtualize some of that? So we're taking very low-end imaging devices in the ambulance, transmitting it using a 5G real-time cloud infrastructure. The image is being rendered and analyzed on the cloud infrastructure. It's straight to the doctor in the, in the hospital, and the doctor can take some very quick decisions and instruct the nurse and the ambulance what to do. So that's a case we work on, as well as with the delivery drones. A third one we are after is all about uh, the disrupting health with uh, robotic surgery. And that's really where we started our journey a long time ago. And the person you see here is Professor Proka Dasgupta. He's one of the pioneers in robotic surgery. And uh, he happens to be at King's College in London, so it's very easy for us to deal with him. Um, so Proka has been operating all his life as a patient on the back. He's using the viewing port, and the patient and the viewing port are connected, essentially, with, uh, with a cable. Why does he do it? Well, he believed that robotic surgery, despite being very slow, is actually very precise. So it's so precise that there's almost no blood loss. No blood loss means the patient can go home uh, pretty much immediately. So instead of a patient recuperating for six, seven, eight days in the hospital, you know, the, the cycle time is much quicker. So operation is slower, recuperation time is quicker, and the patient doesn't have so many scars. So it's quite a fascinating technology. It's gotten better over the years. You need certain skill set to operate that. And when I met Proka, Proka told me, Misha, you know, I'll give you three homeworks, and you need to solve that for me. First thing is he said, I don't feel anymore. Before, when the surgeon was cutting open the patients, uh, they could feel, actually. They could see what's an artery, what's the vein, etc. Now they can't do that anymore. It's just a metal rod going in with a camera. He has to use his visual, um, uh, visual inspe inspe his visual judgment on what he's actually operating. So I gave him back this feeling of touch. We developed uh, the Center for Robotics Research next door to me, developed an ultra-susceptible sensor. We connected it to this haptic glove, and he can feel now uh, through that haptic glove what's going on in the body whilst he's operating, which is a quantum leap for him in terms of precision. 
right? So that's number one. Number two, he said, you know, Michel, I'm, I'm, I'm commuting every day from North London to South London. Uh, King's uh, Guy's Hospital is in South London. It takes him an hour and a half to go down, an hour and a half to go back up. So it's three hours commute. So we're using essentially one of the best surgeons' time, uh, you know, to just to commute in the underground. He asked a really valid question. He said, why can't this viewing port be in a North London hospital? And I operate into a South London patient, right? So solve me that problem of reliability. And we did. We rolled out this 5G uh, ultra-reliable, low-latency network for him to do precisely that. And the third thing he did is he said, Misha, you know that one of the problems I have, I can't build skills. It's very difficult to find students who can operate that machine. As another view import, student learns very slowly. If they fail at the end of the exam, weeks of education have gone down the drain. So once you digitize his skills, literally you take the way how he moves his hands, all the stuff we can do with his glove here and other equipment, and we put it on a skills database, we can replay it. We can put it on an exoskeleton for the student, build the muscle memory until they understand how the operation is done, the sewing is done, the cutting is done, et cetera, et cetera. And then you could run exams on essentially these type of muscular skills. And uh, that is a really big uh, groundbreaking step, at least for King's College, for surgery, for dentistry, and many of the other applications. And uh, well, that is essentially exactly in the spirit of the Internet of, of Skills. And I would like to show you a video from Proca, how he explains how he perceives it, rather from your perspective, my world. We need to disrupt the way we see medical treatment. If you see an open surgeon operating, they will have a bit of tremor at the ends of their scalpel. The robotic instruments are computerized, so they have absolutely no tremor. There is one problem, though. There is no sense of touch at the end of the instruments. It is very difficult to transmit across remote distances and across current robotic systems. In order to do this with haptic feedback technology, you need two things. You need network slicing and you need cloud data share. I think both are possible through 5G. It also allows us to bring the best education internationally to the next generation of doctors. It gives us the opportunity to educate anyone anywhere. Often we have to go to their hospitals, to their sites, to mentor them. With 5G, I think we might be able to do just that, sitting here in my office or in my own operating room, looking at someone operating elsewhere in the world and being able to mentor and guide them, to learn the best principles of surgery. The potential future applications of the technology are not just rapid diagnostics, better robotics. I think there are others, such as the treatment of disabled patients, remote surgery, and also in rehabilitation of those who need it most. Time is so short, time is so valuable. Why take the doctor all the time to the patient and vice versa? Why don't we have a wonderful communication link between the doctor and the patient? Global health, particularly care of the elderly, is becoming a major challenge for the next generation of doctors. We need a better way of communicating with these elderly people. 5G might just be the answer. All right. So I would like, you know, I've left a little bit of time after my, my talk today so we can actually discuss that because that is something which really comes out of your world. And I'd like to see more views on how you will use that type of technology, if it is of use and, uh, at all. So I have a very rare opportunity for me, actually, to have uh, such an intellectual firepower uh, from, from the medical and healthcare world in, in the very same room. But I want to go on. I want to show you a little bit more what we do with the technology. But it would be silly to just develop a very, vertical technology which just works for one specific application. One thing we were very good at always in, in tech is to build that horizontal capability which then disrupts health, finance, uh, media, et cetera, et cetera. So one of the other fascinating ones is on the, on the performing arts world. And if you think about it, the performing arts world hasn't been, hasn't been disrupted ever since, well, you could argue maybe Shakespeare or the Greeks, right? 200 years or 2,000 years. It's always been the same. It's always been a little like of a theater round, and all the content has been built around this. So the arts world, I realized, is actually uh, really creative, but isn't innovative at all. Okay, so my world, the tech world, is really innovative, but not very creative. 
So when we both met, it was a bit of a meeting like, uh, you know, of, of two quantum world, and uh, we embraced each other and tried to come up with something where we could disrupt each other's uh, well-being, in a sense, or uh, status quo. And the, the simple question I, I posed to them, I said, look at, look at Netflix. Could we do something like Netflix? Netflix has disrupted the way we consume content, but it has also disrupted the way how we uh, procure content. So let's look first on the consumption. I mean, we totally change our viewing patterns. We watch now what we want, when we want, uh, on demand, with whom, uh, where we want, right? Totally different from uh, 10, 20 years ago. Now, when it comes to the actual procurement of content, it has also changed the game. And uh, maybe the, that's best ex exemplified with uh, the series of uh, Stranger Things. Who knows Stranger Things here in the room, right? OK. Oh, that's disappointingly low. Let's try that again. Who knows Stranger Things here? Right, OK. You need to watch that. <laughs> Stranger Things 2 has come out. Did you start watching it? It's good? Excellent, right here we have a big fan in the front door. Now, there's one thing really remarkable about Stranger Things. It's actually one of these series which uh, has become really famous without any famous actors, well, except maybe one. But it's actually done by amateurs, really skilled, not going through the whole chain of Hollywood and whatever you call it in Los Angeles. Uh, it's just been, it's been an experiment. Got together, did the script, filmed it, put on the platform, Everybody loved it. The rest is history. That's a change. We brought in people now who have been educated very differently, who just had a dream, maybe hobbyist uh, actors, and therefore are now on a platform which enables them to, to practice their talent. And each of you has such a talent, but you can't do it because you were cast into your educational vertical, right? Isn't that the case? You will have another ke keynote later on and will tell you that everybody has a talent on that. So, and, uh, and that's exactly what Netflix did, and I find it very remarkable. Performing arts is still a very conservative uh, sector, and uh, the education is very harsh. National Theatre, Royal Opera House, all those we work with, years and years, and only the top of them make it. And maybe somebody else in a different country is equally talented and doesn't have the opportunity. So we asked the question, can we actually use that real-time immersive technology to come up with something which would enable an empowerment of talent around the world to be part of this? We have real and virtual actors, real and virtual musicians, real and virtual audiences. And uh, we've tried before and we've failed many times because either the technology wasn't good enough or the content wasn't good enough. So we had, for instance, our 5G ultra-low latency tech, and then we tried to have Shakespeare's Tempest played in three different sides, and it didn't work. It was very poor. The reason is because Shakespeare didn't write it for three different sites. So then we hired a writer, and we wrote this piece of art which works for our 5G ultra-low latency technology and for three different sites. And it's a very, very amazing piece uh, which will be uh, shown in, in, in London next year. So here you go. Um, that's really what we did, and it's now exciting. A lot of the, um, uh, the theaters and the, uh, the, the Royal Opera House, uh, the Royal Academy of Dramatic Art at Kemp, the director said he would use it, actually, because currently he can't tour the country, he can't tour the UK, because the stage typically is very small, like here, but he has to bring actors, musicians, uh, and a whole entourage, and there's a lot of interaction going on between actors and musicians, um, and if he can't have the musicians, he can't have the actors either. So we virtualize these musicians. They stay in London, they play the piece, they interact in real time with the actors, and he can now uh, tour the United Kingdom and Europe. We're not there yet with the United States, but that's the type of stuff we can do. And I'd like to show you a little video we did with Ali Hosseini. I hired Ali into my center. He's one, you may know him. He's quite a prolific American artist uh, who worked with a really high portfolio um, actors and performers. And um, he has been driving that for us here at King's. I think we're at a time when art and science really need to come together. You know, people, they want things to be social, they want it to be interactive. They're not necessarily thinking, oh, I want to see cinema, or I want to see theater, you know, or I want to go to an art gallery. They just want experiences. So as media become more immersive, people are going to merge those different experiences. I've been working with King's College London and Ericsson to create a project called Connected Culture. And during the course of this project, we've been looking at different sensory modalities. So we've been looking at the sense of vision, 
hearing and touch and how each of those will be impacted by 5G networks in the future. We've been working to understand how people, artists and audiences will use networks for performances. So we've been developing new methodologies that are now informing our product development cycle. So we can actually bring things to market that will enable people to have access both creatively and for enjoyment and entertainment. 5G infrastructure is critical for the future of arts and entertainment. I mean, without low latency, you can't have a feeling of immediacy. Without high bandwidth, you can't have a feeling of immersion. You can't have the kind of robust stability that makes people feel like they're in a virtual environment, just looking at a screen or, you know, having some disconnected conversation. So imagine being able to take the theater and just fit it over your head or have it projected into your living room. We think that people need high bandwidth, low latency networks to actually have access to experiences that they would have to travel to get before. All right, does it make sense what you're saying? Yeah, so that essentially it's another example of another vertical very different to the medical and healthcare one and we're using the same technology base. That's really what we want to do because that enables us to bring down the cost and scale the verticals and then we use it both in the, the industries as well as in the consumer market a little bit like the iPhone has done before. And the last one I want to show, talked about, uh, to talk about is actually the whole vision of this Internet of Skills and I had shown... Um, I'd shown this concept on stage last time I talked in Los Angeles with, uh, with a piano. So I did a performance there, launched my album as well. My record label launched my fifth album there. But you see there the, the glove I had it on. That glove here not only reproduces touch. So there's something in here which is quite magical, which makes me feel things. So I can feel um, rain. You know, very useful in London, but I can feel things, right? Organs, texture, etc. But I also can take the exact position of the fingers. So as I was playing the piano, it would actually take the exact the way Hamish is playing the piano. It goes on a database being stored there, and that's being replayed on an exoskeleton, so you can make sure that uh, whether you or your children would learn the uh, the best way of holding the piano position and play certain pieces, right? So because the piano playing is all about building this muscle movement, a uh, muscle memory, which is why I have to train every day uh, two to eight hours, it's, uh, which is quite amusing. So having a piece of technology there would be really good. So I demonstrated that on, on the day and uh, with the ultra low latency network. And let me just show you a summary piece we did with, with Ericsson on that. And then we can, uh, ha we have a lot of time to discuss that type of technology for you guys. Digital has transformed education. We used to teach in classrooms. Now a lot of the stuff is online. We have a lot more. So what we offer here at King's is in essence a platform where industries can come together and test out new things. And so we work with Ericsson on that and we're very excited about this. Transforming the way how we learn and teach piano is very close to my heart and I struggled a lot of getting the right piano positions going and finding the right way of playing certain chords. Applying the Internet of Skills in that setting is very powerful because we could have famous or very good teachers upload a perfect way how to play the piano onto a skills database. We standardize all that information, we store it there, and then we can replay that using an exoskeleton on people's hands so people learn how to play the piano in an optimum way. So we're trying really with 5G to do something which is at least 10 times better. We want to go from a gigabit per second to 10, if not 100 gigabits per second. We want to go down from 100 millisecond to 10, if not 1 millisecond delay. We want to go up from a billion devices to a trillion devices. The ability to transmit skills, so muscle movement, touch. And that's what we're building with this Internet of Skills, the ability to transmit touch, skills, kinesthetic muscle movement with an extraordinary high reliability and very low delay. It allows us to teach surgeons. It allows us to teach people how to repair engines. It allows us to teach a whole set of new skills at scale. These are gigantic steps and would enable transformations in any industry you can think of. So that's really 
it from my end. If I, I would like you to remember one thing is that we will have hopefully one day an internet of skills which will change the way how you engage uh, with your family, your peers, your students, how you teach, how you learn, and hopefully it will democratize a labor the very same way as the internet has democratized knowledge. I'll leave you with that. Thank you for your attention, and I'm ready for a very interesting discussion right now. Thank you. And that is the view from my office, by the way. Right, so does somebody know what's down here? This one here, wait, let me find the right pointer here. Do you know that? Somerset House. So kings tried to buy this for 200 years. We finally got one wing. Um, <laughs> there you go. And probably go shopping later on here. So Colorado's over the horizon. <laughs> <laughs> Right, let's get it going. I'm, you know, I want to be optimistic. I want to know what you think. We have a question here. Thank you. So I'm, I'm a parent. It works, yeah. It works, yeah. Hello. Yeah. I'm a parent of a very vulnerable young man, and I would love to be able to touch him from the other side of the world, but how do I know that a bad actor wouldn't be able to do the same thing. So as incredibly gorgeous as all of this is, which it is, I also worry when I'm watching Congress interview Twitter, Google, and Facebook right mm -hmm. now, that what happens when bad actors get a hold of something so spectacular yeah. as this? Yeah, yeah. So your, your worry is, is a security worry, right? so that somebody else actually gets into the system and tries to pretend you and then takes advantage. Yeah, it's, um, well, it's a difficult question, security question, privacy question. It's always a very difficult question for me to take because we don't have a fundamental answer to that, to be honest with you. And it goes, it goes down to the way how we construct the systems. And the systems today, we strive to make them as secure as possible but because they are so complex and so heterogeneous, you patch one window, something else opens up, right? So we are currently developing a new programming language which is mathematically proven to be secure, meaning anything which is being compiled with that language will not be hackable, right? As long as the humans operating this, the whole system, will not fail. And I was one of these engineers who actually did fail. So I worked for a very big uh, operator for many years, uh, uh, Orange France Telecom, you may know, is the Verizon equivalent here. And we rolled out smart meters all over the country. These are small sensors in the house which would measure your water consumption, your gas consumption. And we went in as engineers, we had to test them very quickly. And what we did is we brought down security from a really high level to zero because that's the quickest thing. Last thing I wanted to do is on thousands of sensors type in passwords. Now, when we left, we often forgot to put security back up, right? So we ended up with a system which was unsecure, not because cryptography wasn't good enough, but because a human engineer didn't read the logbook. So my perception of security has changed over the years. It's, it's remarkably robust, our mathematical tools, actually. As long as no quantum computer comes along, it's a different story. We can handle that in the, in the, in the coffee break. Um, but we need very good guidelines, best practice, for engineers to really enact that security. And all the security hacks which happened, the big ones, was human failure. You know, the baby cameras, you can actually, there's no hack, they're open. They're open, there's a website where you can see baby cameras around the world. Nobody hacked into them, they're just open, right? So therefore, it's again the human in the loop which needs to be educated to run these systems uh, properly. So I think we're getting better, but I can't give you 100% guarantee, but we're working on that, rest assured, yeah. that as a great employment opportunity that say I want to be a doctor and I go 
dramatic obstacle and become a soldier. But I don't have the technology to be a soldier. Does this mean if I want, if I know how to control the robots that I can do anything I want? So it's a very good question you're asking. The question is if the platform enables you, who is maybe not skilled in a certain skill A, to be something. Yeah, so you know about it, right? Yes, okay. So let me rephrase that then. So the, your question is, is if you know, you've gone for a medical education and uh, maybe you are a surgeon for uh, for, for stomach surgery, I'm making this up, so, right? But the question you're asking is if that internet would allow me then to translate that into a very similar type of uh, skill set and do then kidney surgery and stuff like that, is, is that what you're after? I'm talking about if I program the robot to do yeah. uh, Find stuff that I can draw surgery. That means I can do anything I want. Right. No, you, you can't do anything you want. Sorry for that. Right? It empowers. So the prime aim is to empower you with your skills to execute them around the world, whether you're using them professionally or you're using them to train somebody else. That's what we build a platform for. But you're asking an interesting question, and that is, is you know, how much would it cost to go from a skill set A to, go be, uh, to get to skill set B, right? We haven't looked at this, but it's a good question. So my answer is, I don't know. I don't know, yeah? Thank you. Can I, can I maybe clarify, Misha and, and Kathy, please yeah. tell me if I'm incorrect. If I'm incorrect. Um, the exoskeletons that are utilized yes. on the other end, um, if it, an individual has challenges with their fine motor and can utilize that right. exoskeleton, put that onto yeah. their body to yeah. be able to direct them so they have the skill set, oh, yeah, yet they the, could, not the physical right. motor skill yes. maybe. Is that where yes. Yeah, oh yeah, sorry. To do that. So yeah, that is will doable. The, will the then exoskeleton allow and help right. control motor yeah. movement to yeah. execute, say, yes. surgery? Yeah, that's doable. And and we believe that exoskeleton will be, sorry, Ms. So, so that exoskeleton will be an intermediate step. At some point, hopefully, we'll have direct access to more uh, nerval systems. But again, I'm not a, it's not my world. I'm afraid I need to pass on this. I'm sure some people in the room know much better. So, but yeah, thank you. <laughs> Yes. So I have a question about redundancy. Yeah. So uh, Betty talked about bad actors. Then there's also things that have nothing to do with bad actors, but have to do with unforeseen weather systems, anything that could shut down mm. your 5G. Mm -hmm. So. How, and, I, and maybe I'm answering my own question, but it seems like we're always going to need to have humans at both ends who yep. can anticipate some of those somewhat unforeseen yep. circumstances yep. and yep. jump in. I would, yep. I would feel much more confident if a surgeon in London was operating on one of my children, if I knew that there was somebody yep, in the room yep, who yep, could jump in. Yep, yep. No, I agree with you. And uh, maybe that didn't come through uh, so clearly. So the idea is always to have also, particularly for the more critical jobs, to have somebody, a human skill on the other end. Just as with the robotic surgeon Da Vinci. 
There's the high-end medical skill on the actual pulp during the operation, and there's a, a very good medical skill, but not at the quality of the surgeon um, supporting essentially the patient and the operation. So the, the idea is essentially also to democratize a little bit that, that whole process, because often you find realistically, you know, you have the best people in the capitals. And we work now, for instance, in, with China. China, the colon cancer rate detection is extraordinarily uh, bad. It's one of the worst in the world. And there's no reason for that other than uh, the right skill set not being in these uh, suburban and the uh, rural areas because they all live in Beijing and Shanghai uh, and Wuxi, et cetera. So therefore, the ability to bring in high-skilled high, high uh, skill set into the rural area with medical support uh, is what we're driving at the moment. So yes, there are people on both ends. Yeah, absolutely. First time somebody put it to me was like, would you have a robot do an eye operation? So no, the answer is I wouldn't, right? So here you go. <laughs> yes, sorry. I think these technologies are awesome, creative, um, futuristic. Um, one of the big strategy I think we need to look at in the future is the access to the cloud and the cost for people with cognitive disabilities, mm. I think that's something that we need to include in our mm. strategic plans mm. because we're jumping into a new area mm. that we really don't have the infrastructure. And basically, if we don't think about how people with cognitive disabilities will have an opportunity for access without thinking about the cost and yeah. the, the um, as you say, the democratic Democratization, yeah. Yes, um, yeah. that that's key, that we mm. make that a priority yeah. Yeah. to do that. I couldn't agree more with you. So in the, the underpinning infrastructure is an, an absolute must and enabler of all these capabilities. Now, we were very clever to design the internet in a very um, flat fashion. So as long as your tech speaks IP, the, uh, you know, anybody can connect. What we did with that is, though, we decoupled the Facebooks from the cables and the routers, right? And the problem now is, is that everybody on top is making very big money and is not reinvesting this back into the infrastructure, which is why you can't make a phone call at 5 p.m. in the afternoon, right? That's the actual reason. If only 1% of that wealth went back into the infrastructure design, we'd be in a totally different ballpark figure. So on one end, the decoupling allowed us to scale the internet. On the other hand, it's now developed two ecosystems going at a very different cycle and therefore holding back that. So I totally resonate with you and you know, we need that support, uh, rollout, democratization of access to infrastructure. We're working on this. And we have technologies to do this today, uh, such as blockchains, distributed ledgers, which can build this trust relationship back between, let's say, the Facebooks of the world and the Verizons rolling out the infrastructure. We're on it. We're on it. Give us some more years, please. <laughs> okay. Uh, I was wondering, I have a problem with my executive function. And, um, and what, uh, what could psychiatry do? to help with my uh, executive function and, uh, and my uh, cognitive abilities and what can computers do with that? I heard about lumosity and can you explain some of that? Right, so the, the question is how could the technology uh, assist you essentially uh, with, uh, with your daily life, right? Executive functions, yes. Uh, what type of functions? Executive uh, functions. Executive functions, right? Executive in in terms of executing a job, or is that is that yeah? Yeah. Okay. Right. Okay. Um, well, I'm not sure I'm the right person to answer that. To be honest, I'm not sure if somebody else in the room can help me there. I need to pass on that, I'm afraid. So I know that from a tech point of view, we can do a lot of stuff. And one thing we would do is, coming back to the previous question, uh, utilizing edge cloud technology to have a lot of the assisted functions in there uh, so there's a quick access to whatever you need to do. Um, what is a good example there? <clears throat> Misha, maybe you're some oh, I'm of sorry, research yeah. on uh, your research you're doing, doing with the autism community. Yeah, R right, OK. The one we talked about yesterday. All oh, right. Okay. I'm not sure. It Will it answer the question? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Right. So you see, I'm coming from a totally different planet here. So you need to help me here. Um, 
So, what do, so we work in Kings also with the, uh, with the autism community, and um, um, a good friend of mine is uh, very autistic, and he, he told me he's, uh, he perceives the world very different from us, right? So something which I'm able to zoom out very easily, some movement or some light or some sound, uh, they get very saturated that, with that. So we're using essentially uh, a technology to adapt the environment, the rooms, to, uh, to somebody who has the, that type of disability in the room to bring down the lights, adapt the music, uh, change even the furniture, etc. So help self-driving furniture in the room, uh, just to give that uh, feeling, uh, I think, more peace of mind. And just, it's, it's a very simple way of me articulating that, I have to say. But uh, yeah, Misha, you can help me with that. Yeah. Right. OK. You take it offline then. Yeah. OK, thank you. Yes. Um, hi. Um, I'm a developmental pediatrician. And um, I'm here at the University of Colorado and Children's Hospital of Colorado. And we serve a very large catchment area. And we have a long waiting list. So we're starting to use telehealth. Yeah. But it's quite limited. Yeah. Um, so I do diagnostic assessment yeah. for different disabilities, yeah. including great. a lot with autism That's spectrum great. disorders and neurologic exams yeah. that are going to drive my medical workup. Yeah. Yeah. So right now, we could do a history. We could observe the child mm. at the other end in an in a office at the other side of the state. We could have somebody take vitals. But we really can't do a good neurologic exam as yeah. well as face-to-face -face assessment. Yeah. Yeah. So is there technology where, where we don't have to bring people hundreds of miles yeah. in yeah. for assessments or yeah. even a more exact um, medical evaluation? Yeah. So we hope that with the ultra low latency 5G tactile internet, we're able to get you closer. You know, I would lie to you if I said, yes, that's the technology, because we haven't proven it yet in that yeah. context. But uh, what is emerging more and more from, you know, medical engagement with the actors and the musicians, that this, what, what humans value really is this feeling of immediacy, right? So something happens. You and I, we're talking now here. There's a real kind of uh, uh, almost a real-time control feedback going on between you and me. Now, we don't have that on Skype. Okay, we don't have that with all the tele stuff, uh, telemedicine stuff. So the ability to literally have a millisecond delay, maybe you know there's a 360 inward camera around you, and I have my virtual reality headset. I just have this feeling to be with you, and therefore brings us closer from a human point of view. So we're we're looking at this right now, and uh, you know I'm I'm not sure it will be the answer. Yeah, yeah. If it will be, that would be quite a quantum leap, I think, for, for professions like yours, yes. Okay, mm. thank you. All right, thank you. Mm. We'll do one more. Thank you. My question's a technology question on the ultra-low latency. Yeah, um, I can do that. Every generation of wireless has brought greater low latency yep. for a short period of time, yep. and then <laughs> it's become very high latency yeah. because yeah. of capacity right. overload. How do you see this mm. being resolved with 5G? Mm. Because 5G could become slow. Yeah, could be. So the slowness, just those who are not skilled in the arts, absolutely right observation. Uh, systems, as we bring them in, they're very quick at the beginning, but then get congested because everybody's using that, and that's when things become slow, right? It's like on the on the high, highway, you're coming into the uh, congested city. So. Um, Here's the thing, right now as telecoms is constructed, there's no way we can do that, we can assure you to have a low delay with 5G in 20, 20 years time, right? We can't. But one thing I'm pioneering now is a total restructuring of the whole ecosystem. We are ripping the technology literally apart. There are two things we're doing. We are decoupling hardware from software, and on the software components, we are totally decoupling functionalities. So currently, to maintain a 4G system, you need a huge infrastructure in the US. You know, Verizon has uh, you know, thousands of kilometers of fiber. What I'm trying to do is, is to make sure that you can have 5G on a chip. Right? Every single phone, every single computer becomes an, a 5G system on its own. Requires new ways of managing spectrum. But again, we have distributed ledger technologies which can do that. So I'm currently trying to, to totally disrupt that, that space there. And I'm, I'm also on the uh, advisory board of Ofcom, which is our FCC. Um, and they have given green light now to do some of that uh, in, in London, which is quite exciting, actually. Maybe not 5G, but hopefully 6G. Actually, I'm working, making sure that there will be no 6G. I just don't think that's a good idea, right? Can we leave that with that? No 6G. 5G is the last thing you will see on your phone. <laughs> All right. 
That's it. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. Please give Thanks. Misha a round of applause. <laughs> I'm going to just walk him off the stage. <laughs> Well, thank you. So how many of you are wowed by that technology? How many of you are excited by that technology? Yeah, pretty amazing stuff that we have an opportunity to be involved in.